You're watching Adorama TV. Hi everybody, welcome to Adorama TV. I'm Mark Wallace. Today I want to take a first look, my first look, at the Nikon D4. Now I only have had this for a brief amount of time and so I'm going to give you my first impressions and in addition to all of this stuff, stay tuned to Adorama TV because Adorama Pro will be adding videos of comparisons and real world uh, shooting scenarios for this camera. So we have a lot more information to come on Adorama TV, but let me tell you my first impression. First, let's start by my real world experience. So I was able to take this, I was able to shoot out uh, in bright sunlight in the studio. I was able to test out the focus system and all kinds of things that people asked me on Twitter and on comments. So let me show you, I've got a bunch of images on my iPad here that I'm looking at that will show you. This first image here is an image that I took in bright sunlight of a, a stairway in Phoenix, Arizona. And the thing that I really love about the D4 is its ability to really pull out colors and uh, you can see here that I saturated this highly in post-production. Now one of the things that I really like about this camera is this brand new card that it comes with. Let me just show you this really fast before we get too much into this. It's this guy, it's a Sony card and it's called an XQD. This is a 16 gigabyte and uh, the D4 that I had came with a card reader included. And so you got the card reader and the card. And so it's a really high speed, it's high capacity, and it was able to keep up with uh, really fast shooting, it was able to keep up with movies, all that kind of stuff. So that's something I really liked um, as I was using this camera. So um, another thing that we did was we threw this in the studio. We actually used the D4 uh, in a recent digital photography one-on-one -on -one episode and we shot in the studio. And one of the things that I found was this camera has terrific dynamic range. It really has the ability to pull uh, information out of the shadow details and even in the highlights. In fact, I have a photo here that I took and you can see that it's just this washed out sky of a building in downtown Phoenix. And I took this intentionally uh, of a photo that was uh, something that most of the time you wouldn't be able to save that detail. But take a look at this. It's the same picture. I edited that in RAW. This is not an HDR photo. It's just one photo that I was able to bring the exposure values in, bring in the highlights. And you can see I was able to bring in almost the entire sky. And that is really impressive. And I think that's the name of the game for the D4, the dynamic range. You really get this expanded dynamic range where you can bring in those details. The gradients are beautiful. And that's one of the things that I think sets the D4 apart from its predecessors. So let's keep going. There's some other things I was able to do here. Low light, people are asking, how does it uh, work in low light? Well, uh, if you're a D3S owner, the D4 works about the same in low light in uh, real world experience. It's exceptionally well. And so you can shoot in almost zero light. So this image here of these pipes, there's another image of this uh, garage here. I even have some video that I shot inside this parking garage. Now forgive me, I did this handheld. But what you can't tell is this parking garage is really, really dark. So we have uh, light coming in from the sides, but where I was standing, it's really, really dark. And so these were all shot at about 12,800 ISO. And you can see it's able to perform in low light with no external light. So if you're a, an event photographer, wedding photographer, somebody shooting in low light, the D4 is going to be able to handle that just fine. Now, if you're a D3S owner, it's not going to handle low light any better than your D3S, in my opinion. So it's not a reason to upgrade if you already have a D3S. If you don't, uh, this is a great camera. Now let's take a look at the noise at ISO 12800. So here's an image that I shot, and this is just a door. And I chose this because this was the darkest part of this parking garage. And so, in fact, this was so dark that I couldn't even see this with my bare eyes. So I couldn't see uh, the, sh the, the corner here. So the camera could see things that I couldn't, which I thought is really impressive. And so I got really close to this caution tape and took a look. You can take a look at this and you can see at ISO 12800, there is definitely some noise, some grain. But I think it's pretty pleasing grain. And for what we're shooting and where we are shooting, it is pretty amazing. So I would rate that on a scale of one to 10 at spectacular. It is really, really good at that kind of work. Um, and so low light, wonderful. Uh, video in low light, wonderful. It's really, really terrific. 
So what about colors and saturations and metering and that kind of stuff? So I just zipped around and shot some things. So here's some flowers. You can see that I got really nice bokeh. The full frame sensor is amazing. I was able to really get some saturated looks. Here's some balloons. Notice these balloons here. You can only see the contrasty light on the balloons and there's lots of color there. But notice that the sky is not overexposed. And so um, that might not look too impressive, but because of the time of day, this was about two in the afternoon in Phoenix where it's really bright and contrasty, and most cameras aren't able to do this. So what you would get is nice balloons uh, and the color there, but the sky would normally be just be way overexposed and totally wiped out. So that is a really impressive shot. Um, you can see I did that again with this theater here where uh, shooting right up to the sky, we get the whites, we get the blacks in that sign, and we even get the sky. So again, dynamic range, dynamic range, dynamic range. It's really, really impressive. One other thing I wanted to check, I went to this, this really colorful shot here. This is a photo of the inside of a newspaper stand. So this is where people stick magazines and stuff so you can grab those like The Voice or things like that. So. Um, this shot, I just really oversaturated. I mean, I took the saturation to all the way to 10, as much as I could get out of it, to see if I could pull colors out of a photo that really didn't exist in real, the real world. In fact, uh, Michael was there shooting with me when I showed him these that I edited, again, in RAW. Um, he was really impressed, like, wow, I didn't, those colors weren't there. And that's the joy of this. So you can really get some J. Mizell type photos with the D4. You can take pictures, you can really yank some color out of those. And I took a few of these to show sort of the textures and stuff. And speaking of Michael, I asked him to pose for me. So uh, he just uh, was a good sport. We put him up against the wall here and I made him be all country star. And you can see we have really, really nice uh, uh, high dynamic range here. So his white shirt, all the details are there. The details in his hair, which is totally black, we still get that. So dynamic range, I can't stress that enough. Again, here's some blurry uh, newspaper dispensers, and I really like that. So there's my shout out to Brian Peterson with the shaky slow shutter picture. So real world experience, the D4 is very impressive. Great dynamic range, great low light capabilities, great uh, video capabilities in low light. The question though is if you have a D3X or a D3S, is it worth the upgrade? In my opinion, I'm not so sure it is. So the D3S does amazing things in low light and the D3S has amazing dynamic range. Uh, and so I'm not sure it's worth the move from a D3S to a D4, in my opinion. Now, if you have a D3X, the D3X doesn't have quite that dynamic range. And so the move up would probably be worth it if you're looking for dynamic range. If you're looking for pure pixel power in the studio to really blow up your images, throw them on billboards, if you're a commercial photographer, well, moving from a D3X to a D4 would probably be going backwards because the D3X has a higher resolution. So this D4 is a 16.2 megapixel camera. And you might be thinking, why would you go from a higher resolution to a lower resolution? Well, you do that because that's where you get that dynamic range boost. And so uh, again, if dynamic range and low light and low noise is something that you need, the D4 is what's going to deliver that. So let's talk about that 16.2 megapixels. That comes on a brand new full frame CMOS sensor. It's an FX sensor and it does this wonderful job of capturing all that light in a range of an ISO all the way down to 50, which a lot of studio shooters are gonna love that, all the way up to 2004, 800. Now that's expanded, um, normally up to 12,800, but you can just go into crazy low light with this camera. It's pretty impressive. One of the things that I have seen in the studio with the Nikon predecessors, specifically the D3S and X, is in low light, the autofocus system was lacking. And so uh, when I was, uh, a lot of times in the studio, when I'm trying to focus in low light with just modeling lights on the D3S, the D3X, I've had some frustrating moments. And so, and, and the same exact light with a uh, different camera manufacturer, I was able to focus just fine. So I wanted to know, is the new 51 point autofocus system, is it better? And so we did a test side by side. I got a D3S, I got a D4, and we turned all the lights off in the studio, no modeling lights, nothing, just some ambient light floating around here and there. I think we turned on the lights from our makeup counter and we said, okay, there's a thing over there, let's shoot. And every single time the D4 was able to focus and shoot 
uh, about two to three seconds faster than its D3S counterpart, and sometimes the D3S and the D3X couldn't focus at all, and this one was able to focus pretty much every single time. And so in my experience, my hands-on experience, the autofocus system is far superior to its predecessors. Now one of the things that has always bothered me about Nikon cameras is that when you have a speed light and you use exposure compensation, it takes all, everything, the flash, and the ambient light up or down and everything comes along for the ride together unlike Canon cameras where you can move those independently so you have to in an Nikon camera usually shoot in manual mode if you want to separate your flash exposure from your ambient light exposure well finally in the D4 there is a new feature it's called exposure compensation and you can uh, it's not that's not the new feature they've always had exposure compensation but it uh, allows you to, uh, to move that away for the flash so let me just show you this so if I go into my uh, bracketing flash, which is E, and I go down here to 4, exposure compensation for flash, I can now say entire frame, and so it adjusts everything altogether, or background only. In other words, exposure compensation for ambient light only. That might seem like a little thing, but ask any Canon shooter that uses speed lights, it's a huge thing. That is something that allows you to really quickly dial in your ambient light and, uh, and fix your uh, flash exposure without having to go into manual mode and do a bunch of things. And so that is one feature that finally, thank you Nikon for uh, separating the exposure compensation. To me, that's significant. Is it worth going and spending $6,000? No, I don't think so. But finally, I hope all future Nikons do the same thing. Let's talk about ergonomics. So ergonomics on Nikons, I think, have always been uh, their strong suit. So they always have really, really nice ergonomics. One of the things I love about all the Nikons is they put so much uh, control right here where you just don't have to dive into a menu. It's just right there ready for you to make an adjustment. So they have continued with that uh, with this camera and they've even made it better. So one, a few of the things that I really love. Now we have a live view mode that you can either have live view for movie or live view for stills. And that allows you to optimize uh, the, the information on the screen and how you're viewing that differently for each of those and so that you don't have to compromise. So I really like that. That little switch is down here out of the way so you're not gonna accidentally bump it. We have the ISO and the quality and the white balance and voice memo and microphone. All that stuff is where it always has been. We've got a great readout. We've got a great LCD screen. We have uh, our normal playback uh, buttons, all, all that stuff that you are normally used to. One of the things that I noticed by accident actually in the studio is when you push this little guy over here to turn on the light, normally that illuminates this top LCD panel. It still does that, but now it also illuminates all of the controls, all the buttons, and so they just sort of glow which is great. So now if you're in the studio or in a dark environment and you want to figure out like how to magnify or zoom out or whatever, these are going to light up. And even this little white uh, line right here lights up so you can see sort of what shooting mode you're in. So it's really nice. Little things like that really are uh, exceptional details to this. There are some other things that I really like over here. Now on the side we have a microphone and headphone jack. They're separate, so those pop open, and so your microphone, a headphone jack. We have a, a port right here that allows you to attach a wireless transmitter, a Wi-Fi transmitter, the WT5. Also, HDMI output, and there is a network cable. So you can put in, uh, if you're shooting on a network and you want to do remote capture, high speed, high quality transfer, you can do that and some controls. So um, I wasn't able to play with the networking controls, but um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to test that out and get back to you on that. Also watch Adorama Pro. They're going to be adding some information about that stuff. One of the things that I love about the controls on this, and again, I can't stress how I love how Nikon does their controls. The autofocus system now has this little button on the side. And so uh, if you want to change the autofocus uh, how your autofocus works, which autofocus points are used. In the past, there had been this little switch right here that's gone. Now you just push this, and on the top, there's a little readout, and it's, uh, you can do a single point auto, which it chooses for you, which autofocus point to use. Um, there is uh, the different systems, so you have continuous, and then for there, you have single, you have the nine points, the 27, 51 points, 3D, so depending on if you're in single or continuous, there are all these different modes you can use. And you get there just by pushing that. So it's really, really quick. You can see that the metering mode has been moved up here. You've got a bracketing control, your flash control. 
uh, your drive modes are here. There's a quiet mode, high speed uh, shooting. There's a lot of things. One of the things, though, that's a grump for me is when you change from horizontal shooting to vertical shooting, I want all those controls to be exactly the same. They're close, but they're not the same. So when you move, see right there, my thumb hits right on this little joystick. When I move here, it doesn't. I have to come down here. So it's not the same place because of this little guy right here that allows you to open up the back hatch. So it's close. It's not exactly the same. Um, I wish that was a little bit better. Speaking of these joysticks, though, they really allow you to choose your autofocus point quickly in addition to this multifunction dial. There's just a lot of things in the or ergonomics, so I'll stop there, but I could go on a long, long, long time. Now, a few other things. You can add your IPTC data right from your camera. So you can put all your copyright information, location stuff. You can do that. There's in-camera raw processing, just like its predecessors. There is some really terrific things when it comes to shooting video. So there is D-movie shooting functions, so uh, lots of dynamic range. So this camera can shoot up to 29 minutes and 59 seconds. So that's a big jump up. So now you can shoot uh, realistic videos, interviews, and things like that. Now you only get 29 minutes and 59 seconds in normal quality. At high quality, you get down to 20 minutes. And I think most people are going to want to shoot at high quality. And so realistically, you get about 20 minutes of shooting time, which is double what it was before. The other thing that's really cool about video mode is that there are now three formats for HD movies. So there is the FX-based, in other words, the whole uh, sensor, just like you have known it. There's DX-based, which, and there's also a 19 by 20 by 1080 crop. So how would you use that? So in the FX mode, that's great when you really want to use the entire sensor for really shallow depth of field, for that really nice creamy bokeh, or if you're using a wide angle lens, you can use that entire sensor. It's really, really nice. In DX mode, you can use that with DX lenses or for macro photography. And also, uh, the 1920 by 1080 crop is great because it, uh, it gives you a 2.7 increase to your focal length. Now, it's a crop. We all know that. But it allows you to look like you're getting in a lot closer. And that's really nice uh, if you're shooting video. It also has a built-in external stereo microphone terminal, which I showed you earlier, and a headphone jack. It does all kinds of stuff. So the first look. Uh, my summary is this. If you're looking for a high-end pro camera, and this is $6,000 for the D4, and you want something that has high dynamic range and it has some advanced capabilities for shooting video, the D4 is a camera for you. If you own an existing D3S or a D3X, I think you really have to evaluate why you would upgrade. If you're looking for low light and you've got a D3S, I don't think that move is one that's wise. If you're a D3X owner and you need high resolution images and you want every single pixel to count, then I don't think that is wise. But if you need better video, you need better dynamic range, and you like some of the capabilities of the new menus and the ability to separate the flash from the ambient light exposure and some of those things, then I think the D4 makes sense. So the D4 is a terrific camera. I don't think it's for everybody but I think Nikon has done a spectacular job. Now, let me remind you that there is so much to do with the D4. There is no way that we could fit it all in, and we've been talking here for about just shy of 20 minutes, and I've just skimmed the surface. So at Adorama TV, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be showing you more behind the, or not behind the scenes, but more product demos and comparisons, and Adorama Pro is going to be helping us out with that. So make sure you stay tuned to Adorama TV. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe to the Adorama TV channel so you don't miss a single episode. Well, thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you again very soon. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.